Good afternoon, everyone. My name is Conor McNally. I'm the Communications Manager at Energy Futures Lab, and it's my pleasure to welcome you to today's uh, lunchtime webinar. Uh, some of you will know that we usually run research seminars uh, on campus every Thursday during term time at, at 12 o'clock, but this is the first time that we've run it as a webinar, and um, so we're delighted so many of you can join us um, for this. And some of you probably joining us for the first time, so you're very welcome. Um, today's webinar is delivered by Caroline Ganser. Caroline has a Master's in Advanced Chemical Engineering from Imperial College and is currently a PhD candidate at the Centres for Environmental Policy and Process Systems Engineering. Her research is focused on integrated modelling of the decarbonisation of power, heat, transport and industry in the UK. Previously, Caroline has worked at BASF in China and the Fraunhofer Institute and Volkswagen in Germany. And since 2018, she's been active as a consultant to both the public and private sectors. So just to let you know how the webinar is going to work, Caroline is going to speak for around 30 minutes and then she'll take your questions. To submit a question, uh, use the Q&A box, which is available on the right hand side of the screen. Um, and please put your name and affiliation with the questions. I would suggest holding off uh, on submitting those questions until Caroline has come close to the end of her presentation, just in case they're answered during the presentation. And with that, I'll pass over now to Caroline. Uh, yes, thank you for that. Uh, thank you for the kind introduction, Connor, and thanks everyone for joining um, this this webinar. Um, let me just start by saying that I hope everyone is, is doing okay in, in these crazy times. I know this has been difficult for all of us in, in our community, and I hope you're all doing okay. Um, yeah, it's good to see that there's interest in the work that we're doing. And um, yeah, let's start. Um, I'm, I'm Caroline. I do some research in Niall McDowell's group at the Centre for Process Systems Engineering and the Centre for Environmental Policy. And I would like to share some work that we're doing on interseasonal grid scale energy storage. What I'm noticing kind of when I read the news um, following energy systems modelling, we see kind of the disconnect with regard to renewables. On the one hand, it's clear that they're going to be a part of a sustainable net zero energy system. And on the other hand, we're kind of getting to the realization that just renewables is not going to get us to net zero and that renewables need to be complemented by other technologies. And maybe Germany is an example for that, showing that just deployment of renewables probably will not deliver net zero and that grid stability and energy security also um, play a role in the, uh, the path to decarbonization. What adds to that is sector integration in the energy system. So, um, and specifically with the electrification of transport and heat, there is an increased demand on the power sector. And that change in the demand is visible not only in the kind of in the in the decarbonization over the decades leading up to 2050, but also in the, the variation throughout the year and the variation throughout the day. So we, we can see that demand would probably become more peaky as we add in these different sectors to the power sector. I've compiled a list of different things that um, we're concerned about with regards to energy transition. Um, the, the main risks, of course, are power outages leading to social and economic loss and missing climate targets. And of course, the social and economic loss associated with that as well. And there are several several reasons um, that that kind of could lead to outages and to missing climate targets such as the but it's not only the variability of power supply it's also concerns about grid stability and ancillary services um, another aspect that i think is worth mentioning is the speed of the transition there are limits to the speed of capacity expansion and if not enough new capacity can be built this might lead to a system that doesn't end up being net zero carbon in 2050. Um, some of the ways to mitigate the variability of the power supply and the variability of the demand are, of course, um, the expansion of the transmission grid and interconnection with other countries as well, and energy storage um, in, in kind of balancing out the intermittency of renewables. In terms of grid stability and ancillary services, there are technologies that can be deployed to mitigate those risks. Um, and for example, um, things like a synchronous compensator providing synthetic inertia. One thing that is, we, we feel that there's 
often the focus on short term energy storage, also battery storage and pump hydro. And there is a lack of work on interseasonal energy storage. And so and to address this gap, um, we've kind of tried to look into the, the ways interseasonal energy storage could work in specifically the UK energy system. These are some of the questions that we've been trying to tackle with this work. Um, so what's the potential for grid scale energy storage in the UK, specifically when we account for electrification, which function does it take on in the system? And could we identify maybe priority priorities for the deployment, for the development of these technologies? So which aspects of the technologies could we improve? And um, how does the technology interact with other technologies in the system and can we identify cost optimal combinations? The tool that we're using, some of you might be familiar with, and we call it ESO, it's the Energy Systems Optimization Model. It was developed in our group and it is a combination of uh, unit commitment capacity expansion um, with a variety of constraints on the power demands, on ancillary services, on transmission, on the scheduling, etc. We are able to get from the model output the technology deployment up to 2050 and also kind of the dispatch uh, over the day and the year. One thing to note is that it is an optimization model and that means we're not we're not predicting the future, we're not making a simulation, we're determining, we're always determining a cost optimal system design and operation. With regards to electrification, I'm showing you here the electrification scenarios that uh, I have synthesized that we're working with at the moment. Um, they're based on the future energy scenarios from the national grid and other publicly available data. And maybe as a, as a key point, the central electrification scenario um, comprises about 50% of road transport and 50% of residential and commercial heat demand being electrified. Um, there are more assumptions that go into these specifically that I am not going into right now. Um, I just would like to show you what that looks like. In, in practice, you can see the power demand profile that we're using for the summer of 2050 and the winter of 2050. And you can clearly see the not only the demand becoming more peaky, uh, but just also varying on average between summer and winter. And by the disaggregation by sector allows us to incorporate this changing profile, not only the daily change, but also the seasonal change in the model. And we can see the impact of that on the deployment and the operation of technologies. The next key part of the input parameters is, of course, the storage technology that we're modeling. And we have chosen power to methane storage. Um, this is because um, uh, yes, so the the electrification scenarios are um, some part of part of them is based on the future energy scenarios. That's correct. Um, with regards to power to methane storage, previous work in our group has shown that it might have advantages over power to hydrogen, and that is um, specifically because of the high cost associated with hydrogen storage. Um, we're solving this model in linear relaxation, so we're solving a linear model um, and we're using full hourly demand and renewables data to see these seasonal effects. One thing to note is when you look at the technology parameters of the storage technologies, the power to methane storage is about twice as expensive in terms of capex and has about half the round trip efficiency of other storage technologies that we're considering. And um, the kind of the the thing you get for the extra extra cost is, of course, the very, very long storage duration. And um, just from looking kind of at this table, we were not able to tell if this storage technology adds any value to the system, um, which motivates the work that we've done. Answering um, the question that just popped up, another question that popped up, these are further important assumptions for all the runs that I'm going to present today. 
we're operating with a net zero carbon target in 2050. Uh, we do not give a specific trajectory. And we have a carbon price on carbon emissions that ramps up from 18 to 240 pounds per tonne in 2050. Um, it's important to note that we assume biomass has embodied emissions based uh, caused by the supply chain, and they are counted towards the carbon target and penalized by the carbon price. The reason for that is that there are fossil emissions associated with the technology, and so um, that's why we're accounting for them. And we constrain plant flexibility, but because it's a linear model, it's constrained via uptime and downtime, and all plants are assumed to be able to start up and shut down within one hour. Another important note before I start showing some results is that build rates are very important for this type of work. Um, what do I mean by build rates? I simply mean the amount of capacity that can be built, um, say within a year or within five years of a technology. And that, of course, has an impact on the design because some technologies might be cost optimal, but if we're not able to build enough of it in the system, um, it might not add as much value. And so I'm always stating next to the results when we, whenever we have increased the build rates in order to allow for a different system design. Um, as, a, as a base case, I'm showing you first a, a system with high amounts of renewables without seasonal storage or dispatchable technology. So on the left, you can see the capacity installed and the expansion of the system to 2050. And on the right, you can see uh, the utilization of the technologies. And you notice, of course, first that you need to expand the system a lot. And there's a lot of capacity that needs to be built. And the second thing is that the utilization of the technologies decreases um, as the system is as the system is built. And this is the case not only for renewables. Um, we can see I'm going to get the pointer. You can see the the curtailment of renewable energy. So this is offshore wind, um, about 50% of it being curtailed in 2050. And also the, the utilization goes down not only for these, but also for technologies that you usually would like to run base load such as nuclear. So even nuclear utilization um, goes down uh, until 2050. Um, how do we fix the system? I'm showing you two ways at the moment. And one of them is with power to gas and one of them is with CCS and power to gas. So um, whenever I talk about power to gas, you'll be able to, to recognize it by this, this teal color at the top of the capacity stack. Um, on the right, this is the system that I had on the previous slide, very high renewables, no long term storage. And this is the same system allowing when we allow the deployment of power to gas. And you see that it allows to reach net zero in 2050 with lower build rates. When you add CCGT, CCS and bioenergy with CCS to that, you can reduce the build rates needed even further. Um, we're going to kind of get to the bottom of that in a second. This is the, the, the power to gas storage level throughout the year in 2050, um, specifically for the case without CCS and central electrification. And you can see the buildup of the storage throughout the year um, and then storage being used throughout the winter. So you have phases in the summer where storage is the storage level is increased because of the solar energy available and phases in winter where the same happens with excess wind energy. And then throughout the year, that storage level is used to absorb peak hours. And then in winter specifically, um, power to gas can contribute to meeting the demand um, that is brought to the system by the electrification of heat. And um, the total storage level here is about 12 terawatt hours. And that is, um, might give you an idea that this technology provides a fundamentally different service compared to short term storage. Because this level of um, this storage level and storage density that is this high is would be very hard to achieve that with short term storage.
on on this slide i'm showing you the dispatch schedules for the three cases that we've just looked at so you can see the power to gas and ccs case at the top just power to gas and renewables and the case without power to gas or ccs um, on, a, on a peak day like this day 70 you can see the amount of renewables that are needed and the amount of storage that is needed to still satisfy demand and all the um the, the gray uh, the gray color denotes battery storage so um this variability throughout the day this is quite a lot of battery storage that is needed just to maintain demand satisfaction when power to gas is allowed in the system this um it, it takes over this function on, on peak days um on days without that are not considered peak days battery storage is still used and, and other storage technologies such as um, pumped hydro are still used to um, kind of shift the demand within the day. And this is, of course, because the round trip efficiency of these short term storage technologies is a lot higher, which makes them optimal on a daily basis. Um, and then on the seasonal on the seasonal level, they just don't have enough storage duration in order to deliver the service. When power to gas and CCS are allowed, we see all the technologies working together in the system to, to um, reach peak demand on a day like this. So you can see the renewables contributing throughout the year and contributing a large share. And CCDT, CCS kind of doing this, this load following, that's the, the orange color. And then on peak days, you see power to gas being used and also other technologies such as CCGT. And the reason we can operate CCGT and CCGT CCS in the system is, of course, because we allow bioenergy with CCS. And BEX in this case provides negative emissions, which allows the emitters in the system to be used on days like this. And one thing that is not shown here, but that is uh, kind of more in the text, is the fact that storage in on, on days like this not only provides um, contributes kind of to satisfying the power demand it also can provide reserve and inertia of course and this flexibility of a technology to kind of operate right then and there and start up um, and, and follow the load i think that um, flexibility has great value as well as you can see uh, in the dispatch How does that result change for different levels of electrification? Um, this is capacity expansion for different levels of electrification with CCS. And um, so it's uh, install capacity and the power produced and the storage to demand. And you can, this, the, the simple thing to see is that you need more dispatchable generation in order to achieve higher levels of electrification, which is perhaps unsurprising. And um, this is especially true when the amount of renewables that can be built is limited in some way. So you can see right here it is limited by the build rate. And if we assume that we cannot build more renewable energy, we require dispatchable generation. In a case without CCS, the answer is, is similar. We need to relax the build, build rate constraints here in order to achieve net zero by 2050. And we need more power to gas storage and more renewables generation. One question that we were asking ourselves when we looked at these results was, okay, why is the system designed the way it is? What is the constraining factor? What is the bottleneck? And so we went through the dispatch schedules of the three system designs to look for the sequence of days that might be causing the system to operate this way. And so I'm showing I'm going to show you a couple of dispatch schedules over a sequence of days um, for different extreme solar and wind availabilities. This is solar, a case of low solar availability. This is um, the beginning of the year, so um, day one through 11. This means beginning of January. And of course, the amount of solar in the system is very low. Um, but we can see here that it's 
um, it's basically not an issue for the system because there is enough wind in this case. And um, short term storage, what you can see here, is able to kind of balance this fluctuation throughout the day. Um, and then CCS um, or power to gas um, can would deliver this service um, if they're available in the system. The case with low wind availability, um, we see the system kind of struggling a little bit more. You see the amount of battery storage needed just to make up this, just to make up, just to shift solar from the middle of the day to the peak hour is substantial. And in the case without power to gas, we see nuclear power interconnection, um, pumped hydro and battery storage working together to um, kind of get over this, this four day period with low wind availability. And the interesting, uh, the very interesting case is when, when both come together. And this is a sequence of days um, towards the end of the year with low solar and low wind availability. And in the system without power to gas or CCS, this is when, when lost load occurs. So for three days, nuclear interconnection battery storage are still able to manage the demand. And then on the fourth day, there is no, there's no more storage in the, there is no more storage level in the battery and we have lost load. And this is when power to gas is absolutely essential in the system. So we have four days where about a third or half of the demand is supplied by the power to gas storage. And in case of power to gas and CCS, of course, it's kind of the same picture as before. We have nuclear, um, bioenergy, CCDT, CCS, and the emissions being offset by BEX, which is run based load. Moving on to the question regarding technology improvement, um, we varied the ratio of, of charging rate to discharging rate of the technology as well as the round trip efficiency in order to get a feeling for what an optimal technology for the system might be. I know this graph is, is difficult to read, um, so I'm going to kind of explain a little bit how to maybe interpret this. Um, so if we assume that this is the technology that we have at the moment with a certain capex and a certain charging to discharging rate and a certain round of efficiency, we can imagine what would happen if we were to use a technology that is slightly better but more expensive. So that would be, for example, a technology with a higher round of efficiency, but it would be a little bit more expensive. And what you can see looking at this system cost reduction is that these two fields offer the same reduction in total system costs. This means that if a technology is uh, has, has better technology features, but is more expensive, it might not provide more value. Um, the other thing to read from this graph specifically is that a lower round of efficiency does not prevent power to gas storage from adding value to the system. This can be explained in part probably due to the fact that renewable power has near zero marginal cost. And so the um, that the cost of the round trip efficiency to the system is fairly low because the cost of producing the power that goes into the storage is near zero. And again, the flexibility of these systems would be of interest in order to understand these technologies better. And um, so the way these um, power to gas system might start up and shut down, the way it might be able to provide load following, investigating that could give us more insight on the value that this technology has. Lastly, um, a view on the technology interacting with other aspects of the system. You can see on the right, we varied the capex of CCGT CCS, power to gas and onshore wind, just to see how much of these technologies is deployed in the system in each one of these cases and how it impacts the cost of the system. One thing to see, of course, is that power to gas and wind 
which are uh, the, the two top roles, push against the deployment of CCGT CCS. So when CCGT CCS is very expensive, we see more power to gas and intermittent renewables. And when it when we assume it's very cheap, we see more power to gas and intermittent, we see less power to gas and intermittent renewables. And so we interpret that in, 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 in such a way that if you constrain one of the technologies, you will need more of more of the others. Um, and they kind of they're able to um, if if both are deployed, they're able to co contribute to kind of reaching net zero in, in 2050. And I'm showing kind of effects in this figure as well, just to show that in most cases that we're running, when we allow all the technologies, all of them are deployed. And a portfolio of technologies that is diverse could reduce the likelihood of missing climate targets and could make the system more resilient to uncertainties, such as the level of electrification, renewables availability, etc. Maybe to summarize the main findings of the work that we've done. Um, the, how much value can be provided by power to gas storage depends, of course, how, how the other technologies are deployed in the system, how fast we can build renewables, and as, as just as well as the level of electrification. And it becomes absolutely essential when the deployment of low carbon dispatchable technologies is limited. The optimal design of the system is, of course, uncertain. I think that's nothing, nothing new. And it depends on the assumptions that we make around capex, but also on emissions accounting, on policy, etc. What I've seen in this work is that seasonal effects do matter, especially um, when we look at systems with a high share of renewable energy and systems where we see electrification. And I have appreciated the, the, the system's view in evaluating a technology, because if you look at the synergies with other technologies, that enables you to really assess the value of a, one technology block. And for the, for the future, one of the things that I find interesting is the question on how to incentivize deployment of the, these technologies. We see that um, many of these move from OPEX driven technologies to CAPEX driven technologies and how to incentivize their deployment um, would be something something interesting to look at in the future. I have put my email address on top of the screen. Um, so if you're if you're interested in the work that we do and the work that I've done, um, please feel free to contact me. Um, I have some some references here that are probably not that interesting at the moment. And so, yeah, I think I'll, I'll move on to some questions. Thanks, Caroline. So if, if uh, people just want to put their questions into the Q&A box, um, there are some uh, a few there um, already and Caroline will take a look at those um, and get through as many as, as we can. OK, OK. Um, let me see. Will the slides be available? Yes, probably. Um, not today. Um, I will have to confirm, but they're probably going to be made available. Um, how have you projected carbon prices? Um, the, let's go to the next slide. <laughs> the trajectory that we use is based is, is based on base numbers, so um, not entirely sure what exactly the reasoning is, but I think they're in the in some of the base material that they have published. Um, let me just. <laughs> okay, let me just get to the other question. Um, 
OK, I think the question, there's a question regarding electrified heat demand. And um, how much electrified heat do we assume? I think the answer is um, here. So this gives you an idea of the, the amount of electrification that we're including in the model. And it's about, in terms of heat, it's about 50% of residential and commercial heat demand. Um, okay. I'm, I'm trying to pick a question. Uh, how does power to gas actually work? Uh, yes, I think that's a good question and probably something that we can go into in a little bit more detail. And this is the, the schematic from earlier regarding power to gas storage. And it, it, it's somewhat straightforward. Electrolysis is used to produce hydrogen from water using grid electricity. And then hydrogen reacts with CO2 producing synthetic natural gas, which can be stored in a salt cavern and then combusted. Um, in this case, there are two different options that our colleagues investigated, which would be either CCGT, um, so the um, carbon would be recycled through the atmosphere and only direct air capture would be used to um, extract the carbon, the CO2 out of the air and, and for the Sabatier reaction producing synthetic natural gas. The second case B in, on, on this slide includes carbon capture. So the off gas from the CCGT, um, we would capture the CO2 from the off gas and then part of the CO2 would be recycled from the carbon capture and it would only be topped up with CO2 from air. Does that does that answer answer the question I hope? Um, I think there's a question regarding methane leakage and um, so I guess the answer to that is in this schematic as well. So if CO2 is captured from the CCGT, there is of course some CO2 that can't be captured and that goes to the atmosphere. And then this is exactly the amount that needs to be captured by the air capture unit and added um, to the system. So you can see either, so all of the carbon is recycled either through the atmosphere or a part of it can be recycled through carbon capture. And in the, the previous work, we've seen that they seem to be relatively close in terms of cost and in terms of runtime efficiency. And um, it's, uh, there's a, a paper has been published on this by our colleagues, which is uh, the paper reference here. I hope that that answers your question. So there's no, there's obviously no fossil carbon in this system. So um, there can there can be no leakage of fossil carbon because there's no fo no input of fossil carbon. Um, there's a question on how to optimize the size of the hydrogen tank um, to know the number of autonomous days um, for for grid failure. Um, I think um, this links to how our view of the storage technology and storage in general has evolved while doing this work. And um, maybe to answer that, it's it's useful to look at storage not as as one block, 
but as a combination of different things. I think this part of the system, so the electrolysis and, and, and the reactor, etc. This is a, to consider this as the charging part and then the CCGT as the, as the discharging part and to see the, the salt cavern as the part of the system that provides the storage duration. And of course, it would be really interesting to model, to optimize not the deployment of this kind of fixed um, system with the, the specific parameters for the specific technology, but optimize the deployment of these three things in isolation. So it might be optimal to have this part of the technology, so the part that provides the charging to be a little bit larger, and this part that provides the discharging um, to be a little bit smaller. Um, and we and for this for the salt cavern part, so the, the storage duration, the number of days that this technology can provide power for them to op be optimized separately. I think that would be the way to to find out how much how big exactly all of these individual components would have to be. And the question regarding hydrogen in this case, just um, added that to published. Yeah, I would uh, encourage um, everyone to have a, a look at this, this paper that was published in our group. And it's not only hydrogen in this case, is not only that the storage, th that the storage density is not as high when you use hydrogen. It's also that there are capital costs associated with compressing hydrogen and putting it in a salt cavern. And so I think that is the issue, in this case, making hydrogen more expensive compared to methane, that the amount of compression that is needed just varies a lot. Um, and it, it and it is hydrogen storage is so much more expensive in this case that it is worth adding the sabatier and the recycling of the carbon um, for power to gas storage. Um, someone asked um, how we have taken current policy instruments into account and how they could affect the need for seasonal energy storage. And we have taken it into account only to the extent that was on the slide. So we have the, the uh, net zero carbon target and the carbon price. And that, of course, makes the operation of emitters, so CCGT, CCGT, CCS, and bioenergy more expensive. Um, so for example, so what that means is that if we were to consider a scenario without the carbon price, we would see less renewables and power to gas and more CCGT and CCGT, CCS. Um, we have not taken contract for difference um, into account. Um, it would certainly be interesting to do that. Um, there's a question on the PV, um, PV profile. I'm just going to jump to that slide. Um, we're not modeling the we're not modeling the PV profile 
in detail in this work. We're using profiles simulated by Renewables.ninja and we're assuming for the purposes of this work that these profiles stay the same um, throughout the decades. And so this is a combination of all the PV installations that were um, installed in the UK at the time of the simulation for Renewables Ninja, I believe. So we're not specifically assuming west facing, south facing um, PV. We're using um, specific, we, we're using average country profiles. How do the results change if biogas and biomethane are used versus direct air capture? Um, I think this is probably the question regarding to the power to gas technology. Um, we haven't modeled a power to gas technology based on bioenergy. The, um, the feeling that I have when we look at um, when we look at this slide, the feeling that I have is that in terms of bioenergy, the it can probably provide the most value to the system when it is used for bioenergy with CCS, because the um, the flexibility provided by negative emissions. Um, really impacts the system operation. So something like operating unabated gas in 2050 is only possible when we use bioenergy for negative emissions. What is the OPEX cost for power to gas? Um, I don't have the number on the slide. We consider power to gas to have a fixed OPEX and all other operate all other um, OPEX is covered by the operation of the plant. So all the all the heat, all the power that is needed for compression of hydrogen and methane, etc. That is all covered by the operation. So the the OPEX of the technology is relatively low because of course there's no fuel cost and it is all covered by electricity that is put into the storage. Why is power to gas storage technology expected to be the lead technology for interseasonal storage? The answer to that is the fact that the individual pieces of the technology are, are ready for deployment. So going back to the technology schematic, um, con rule of, there, there is Methane storage, natural gas storage is a, that's a, a technology that exists already. Sabatier electrolysis, 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 CCGT, carbon capture, all of that is, is available and um, direct air capture certainly is at sort of pilot stage. But um, yeah, so that's the, the reason we chose this technology is because the individual pieces exist already. That does not mean that it would be the optimal technology for a power to gas system.
what is the life cycle emission for the system? Again, there is no fossil input in, in into the system, so there is no continuous, there, there is no fossil emissions um, that are caused throughout the operation. We have not investigated emissions associated with um, building the system, of course. So um, the embodied emissions of the steel, etc., that's not something that we account for. Um, and that's the same for all the other technologies that we model in the system. Let me just find uh, find another one. Um, um, in the European context, which countries are best worst um, aligned with these insights? That's a that's a good question, and that is certainly something that we are looking into uh, at the moment. It is potentially interesting for Germany, as we've kind of uh, as I've, I've mentioned in the beginning, renewables are um, a priority in, in Germany. And so looking into the technology like power to gas, which can complement renewables in this way, um, would be interesting in the German context. And the, the second part of the answer is probably countries in which CCS is not an option. So if there is no possibility of um, CO2 sequestration in a country and no access to that to a service like that. That's a case where renewables plus long term storage might be an option. we have answered a couple of the questions in that were that were asked already so these are duplicates um, there's a question on compressed air um, would I expect the results to change if we looked at power to compressed air technology um, well, I, um, I I don't know the important um, indicators. The important indicator for a good seasonal storage technology is is the storage duration. And anything that can achieve a storage duration. This high could potentially be suitable for seasonal storage. The, the, the key outcome of this work is that the service that a technology like power to gas can provide is not something that short term storage pumped hydro battery can can do at the moment. And um, so as far as I'm aware, compressed air storage is more in the is not in this range in terms of storage duration. Caroline, we've we've covered a lot of a lot of ground there, so so perhaps we'll um, we'll wrap it up. Just to say thank you very much, Caroline, for your um, for your excellent presentation. Um, and as I say, we we covered a lot of ground there in the questions, so that was that was really great. And thank you to all of you who who joined us uh, for the webinar. As I say, today is the is the first um, time we've run this as a webinar rather than a, an in person seminar. We have a lot more um, webinars. We have a full series of webinars running until the end of June. And you can find the details of all of those um, on the Energy Futures Lab um, website. Next week, we'll be joined by Professor Aaron Walsh, uh, who will be speaking about using techniques from the artificial intelligence community uh, to supercharge optimization and discovery of materials for energy conversion and, and uh, storage technologies. So we hope some of you will be able to join us for that. But for now, thank you again to Caroline and thank you to all of us uh, for joining us. Have a, have a great afternoon.